We're talking about um, some of your work being a bit more abstract. Mm -hmm. So we're going to have you read one as an example yeah. of, of a abstraction. Okay. Unicorn. In the dream, I give Cousin John a glass unicorn. He calls me on the phone to thank me for this prismatic body reflecting our imaginary hope. Cancer makes me believe that inside such fractured places, we might survive a tsunami of grief. Aunt Lucy bakes a forever one, two, three, four cake. Carol listens to music at gate 27. Mom folds a laughing towel. Harry is pitching a Phillies game. Dad paints the Sistine Chapel. Zaya dances on top of the train. Marky swims in a cyclone of fish. Paul Gerard is still only 21. Jana prays for kindness. Here, the dead people I love are dressed in party hats, floating on individual stages of maybe and what if, their only real future already happening. Wow. There's some wonderful, um, a couple of things really. Oh, mom folds a laughing towel. I love that line. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Certain things you remember. Yeah. Yeah. I remember. Yeah. Or is it the so, cyclone of fish? A cyclone of fish. Yeah. yeah that's, uh, so I think that section is the abstract. Like, it's sort of like what you're talking about, right? Like, it, I mean, and yet, you might be moved by the phrasing and it might remind you of something, right? So it's not totally inaccessible. I mean, the rest of the poem, I think, is more narrative and you can enter into it. But when I get there, I think it gets more into that other place that I was talking about earlier, where you might have to do a little bit of work to think, well, what does it mean to be folding a laughing towel, you know? And or what does it mean that uh, Marky is swimming in a cyclone of fish, you know. And I think what I was attempting to do in that section was to name some of the people that I have lost and some of the things that, if, that I'm imagining, if there is an afterlife, that they're doing one of the things that they love to do. Like my Aunt Lucy always baked a one, two, three, four cake, which is like, you know, one <laughs> cup of sugar, two <laughs> cup, two eggs, three flat, whatever it is. Uh, my sister-in-law loved music, and she, you know she came to me in a dream at gate 27. My mother was always laughing, and she always had a towel in her hand, so it looked like the towel was laughing. You know, Harry loved the Phillies. My dad was a painter. Zaya, uh, you know, she was killed by a train, so it's nice to know she might be dancing on top of that. So so on and so forth. You know, it's sort of like how do I make those images? suggests that they're doing something, when something horrible has happened, to transform it into something that could be beautiful or, or magical or, um, you know, maybe and what if, the sort of weird possibilities that mm -hmm. could be there. So, so that's, that's what I was attempting to do in that poem. <laughs> One of the things that I learned pretty early on was that I, I knew I was never going to be like a, po like a poet that was like published a lot or I wasn't going to teach poetry. I knew that wasn't necessarily my path. And so I think when I discovered that poetry could be used as a, I could use it as a facilitator and do workshops, not as a way to critique people's work, but to use it as a stepping off point for their own journeying. And so, um, I guess it was in the, shortly after I reconnected with poetry was when I discovered the Mad Poets in the 90s. I just started writing again and I thought, where can I go? And I heard about the Mad Poets and I just went to an open mic. And I remember Eileen, she just was like, oh, you've got to come back. Years later, when I was hosting a series, I thought, hmm, I wonder if she kind of pegged me for a person that could host a series, <laughs> you know, because she had all these series going, you know, and wanted people to be involved. And I was always very um, touched by that, by her generosity, like her welcoming me in. Eileen is good at motivating. She really and is. Encouraging people to She's write wonderful. and read and 
which is great. And I was very touched by that. So not too long after that, I uh, discovered the National Association for Poetry Therapy. And I thought, well, I had heard of art therapy. Mm. I had heard of music therapy. I didn't know there was a thing as poetry therapy. And essentially, it's basically you search for literature, mostly poems, to use them in groups as a way, as a catalyst for people to either do their own writing or to work through whatever kinds of concerns they might have. So I'll give you one example was that I started to work with the Wellness Center, which was a facility for people living with cancer. And so I began to choose, after I took several courses, I tried to find poems that would invite people to begin to talk about beauty in this time in their life when maybe things weren't so beautiful when they were struggling. And part of what you do in poetry therapy is you introduce a poem that's kind of an easy poem that people can get into. That Valentine for Ernest Mann that sometimes I read by Naomi Shihab Nye, which is about poetry and its power to transform. I always use that because it's, it, it, it does two things. It introduces people right away that they, they, can, they can get over their fears about poetry. You know? So it's a gateway poem. It's a gateway poem. It's a gate, like a gateway drug, but no, it's a gateway poem. Okay. But then what it does is it, it, it makes people feel comfortable that they could maybe explore the next poem. And the next poem maybe is not about cancer, but it might be about an obstacle in your life. And so then we discuss that. And then by the time you get people to trust each other in their sharing, then you can go to maybe a poem that was written by someone who had cancer, too. And so when I discovered that I could, I could do that with poems, that to me felt like that was my calling, more than teaching the art of writing a poem or you know, being a published poet. Not that you can make a living as a published poet without being you know, very famous, but that felt like a complimentary way to do it. And so, it's been very gratifying, and that really has been part of my life's work, is to, to do that. So I've worked with cancer patients, I've worked with hospice patients, I've worked with kids in drug and alcohol, um, people living with mental health challenges. Um, I've been very fortunate to be able to do that work. I consider it a privilege and an honor to be able to do that, and just a little uh, sort of advertisement, I did end up writing a curriculum that was then published by the Institute for Poetic Medicine and is now being used in several different facilities, one in Austin, one in Ohio, one in Philadelphia. So that was, that was very gratifying because that felt like that's what I want a poem to do. I want, for me, poems are acts. You know, they're like, they're like civil disobedience. They're like um, <coughs> courageous, brave acts to take on writing a poem and reading it to someone and, and being brave enough to do that. I think it's a, it's a real act of courage. At least that's how I feel. When I first met you or knew yeah. of you, you were with a group called It Ain't Pretty, Great is that correct? Great memory, yes. Yeah, tell us about that. How did that, yeah. who was involved and how yeah. did it happen? Yeah. Where has it gone? Yeah, so um, I was in a book group when I got out of graduate school and um, eventually that book group disbanded but there were three other women in that group who wanted to continue and what happened is the next book that we chose was Writing Down the Bones by Natalie Goldberg. I don't know if you've ever read no, that book. It's about creative writing. And we realized that what we wanted to do was actually write poems together. And so we met for two years, religiously, bringing poems to each other, critiquing each other's work. And then I said, one time I said, oh, do we feel like we're ready to do a reading? And so we did our first reading at the Quarry Street Cafe. Because you remember oh, the Quarry Street, the old city? I haven't heard that name. I know. The name I long forgot about. Yeah, yeah, I'm sure it doesn't exist anymore. Anyway, so we did it down below in their basement. That was our first. And then we did a couple of Borders when Borders was still functioning. And um, 
Yeah, so we did a number of readings out and about and got larger. Um, and then, you know, people moved away. You know how groups are after, mm -hmm. let's say, about five or six years. Um, people started to move in different directions. And then Michael and I moved to the Lehigh Valley. And so then I, I realized that was going to be hard to maintain that group. Was there anything going on out that way as far as poetry reading? You know, when I first started, there was very little in the Lehigh Valley. There was a few poets. And um, and I met a, a wonderful guy named Matt Wolf in Cleveland. Do you guys know Cleveland Wall? Yes. Yeah. Yes. So Cleveland Wall is in that moment. She's great. And, um, and so one of the things that I did was I kind of hooked up with Matt Wolf, who's a librarian at the Bethlehem Public Library, and he was really interested in doing, in doing some poetry things. So we made a couple things happen at a place called the Ice House in Bethlehem. And then um, I, we ended up moving back, and it's so great, the series is still happening. Oh. So from that small seed that got started, with a couple of us, it's now, I think, you know, Easton is hopping. I think the town of Easton, because of its proximity to Jersey and New York, is really having more and more poets. So I think, I think it's much more than it had ever been. So I'm, it was nice to see that. I was really, I was really happy about that.